Hi, my name is uh, John Ben. I've been in Asia for about 42 years. I first came in 1971 and uh, I happened to be at a cocktail party where I met Raymond Chow. And Raymond, uh, just out of the blue, said, would you like to be in a movie with Bruce Lee? Well, I just arrived in Hong Kong. I didn't know who Bruce Lee was, but I thought it'd be interesting to be in a Chinese movie. So I said, sure. A few days later, I was walking along Nathan Road, and I remembered that Raymond's office was in a particular building. So I just went up to see what it was all about. So we started talking about it, and uh, actually we made a contract right then for a whopping 2,000 Hong Kong dollars. Of course, that'd be worth about 20,000 today. Anyway, so I signed the contract, and he, he called up Bruce right while I was there, and he says, get rid of that boss, so that I've got another one. Hey, he's a great little guy, you know, I mean, he's just, uh, I really didn't know what to think. I mean, he had, I heard, you know, afterwards that uh, uh, he was very famous because of his, the previous films that he had made, and, and I checked into it, but I was very impressed. He's very uh, helpful, very kind, very, uh, a nice, just a nice guy. He was a perfectionist, and all of the fight scenes, he rehearsed everybody until they knew exactly what they were doing, and then he would get it done in one shot. And, uh, but other than that, he was a lot of fun. You know, he loved to show off. He'd, between when the cameras are being changed, the lights and all that, he'd, he'd kick 500 times, or he'd show tricks to the girls on the set, and uh, he was a fun guy. You know. He knew what he wanted to do. This was his big gig, and, and uh, he wanted to, wanted to make it happen, so he just worked very hard with everybody, made sure they knew what they were going to do next, and, and we all did it. Well, everything was shot in the Golden Harvest Studios. Uh, they had, um, you know, built the restaurant set, and uh, a lot of that was done. And then the, another set was the where they had to fight in the back of, in the back of the restaurant. And uh, the car when I drove Mercedes down, and they, they had a big fight with Bob Wall. Uh, that was in a, a, a lot. Now it's a group of tower apartments, <clears throat> but it was just an empty lot. The new territories, but yeah, except for the one where where I was driving Bruce's new Mercedes. That was in a lot over in New Territories someplace. And uh, I remember he had just bought the uh, car the day before. And he says, "John, be very careful." So I was very careful. <laughs> Yeah, I worked in the film uh, approximately two weeks, and they were normally six to eight hours uh, a day. Yeah, but I used to bring I used to bring a couple girls on the set every day because they all wanted to meet Bruce. And uh, one time he said, "John, don't bring any girls tomorrow because Linda's coming." He loved to flirt. None whatsoever. No. I had to be in Mexico years, uh, several years before, and and I was riding a horse through the desert, and I happened to uh, come on the set of uh, Magnificent Seven, with Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen, Charlie Bronson, and I was with two friends. We all on horseback, and Eli Wallach needed. Uh, three more horsemen in his posse, so we got the job. And that was my first movie. It was when I got to set. You know, he didn't really have a script. He had an outline of what he wanted to do. So he would just say, say this. I would say that. Next. <laughs> they ended up calling me One Take Ben because I was always able to get it done in, in one take. Well, when uh, my assistant, uh, what was his name? The uh, the little guy. Wang Ping Yao. Yeah, Wang Ping Yao, and uh, great guy. Anyway, he, he said, I know somebody in, in America who knows Kung Fu. And then I said, Kung Fu? Like, what's that? And it's funny because that somebody got, used that as an ad in uh, 
some commercial, just that little clip in, in Hong Kong. And so even today, people point at me and say, Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah, he uh, didn't know his own strength. And I was standing in front of the chair and he hit me with his shoulder. Or he hit me so hard, the whole chair fell over. I flipped it. And he goes over and pulls me up and says, oh, I'm sorry. And in the next, see, that was the only, only one I had two takes. And the next one, he put some big extra behind the chair to hold it up. And he still hit me pretty hard. I got to be friends, all of them, and, uh, you know, of course, worked closely with, uh, with Bob and, and with Chuck. And uh, it's interesting, several, several years later, I happened to be in Manila. And I was in a, a little bar, and I had a girl on each side, and looked across the bar, and there was Chuck and a little girl on each side. And I said, hey, Chuck, you know, so we ended up having dinner together. And uh, I asked him, I said, if you and Bruce were in a real fight to the death, who would win? And he said, without thinking, he said, Bruce, of course, nobody could beat him. Yeah, I was right there with the Bob Wall fight, and, and uh, I was in the background of the, uh, when they had the fight in the, back, in the restaurant. So I got to watch it and um, there was, of course, only 10 days of it was shot in Rome. And uh, so the Colosseum was a, another set on the, on the set in Hong Kong. And uh, of course, that's one of the reasons so many people watch it because it's the best fight scene probably of any martial arts film between Chuck Norris and Bruce. Yeah, I had a kind of a mixed feeling. It's the first time I saw myself on the big screen and uh, um, it was just kind of a mixed reaction. It was pride and, and a bit of embarrassment and, and uh, but it was a kick, you know. But the fact that uh, the movie is still showing many places in the world today uh, well, uh, at least once or twice a week, somebody will stop me in the street in Shanghai and and uh, say, "Were you in a Bruce in a movie with Bruce Lee?" And I say, "You got a great memory." <laughs> As I mentioned before, uh, I'm still recognized because I haven't changed much. I have I didn't have any hair then. I don't have any hair now. So, so I still have the same white beard and. Uh, so people still recognize me. And in fact, last year, my sister was visiting Shanghai for the first time, and uh, we were on the maglev train coming back from the airport. This guy kept staring at me, and finally he says, were you in a movie with Bruce Lee? And my sister was quite impressed that, that somebody would remember after all these years, but it does happen often. And uh, I was in, uh, Paris and <clears throat> happened to see in the newspaper that this movie was playing so I was with some friends who had not seen it before we went down there the same movie Wave of the Dragon had been, been playing for over 10 years in that same theater day after day after day and uh, the manager saw me coming in he says mon dieu le big boss <laughs> so we got free popcorn <laughs> Yeah, because he was uh, um, he was mobbed in the streets. I mean, he couldn't go anyplace. I had a little house in in Lantau. Sometimes he'd bring his family over just to uh, so the kids could swim in some clean water, and he wouldn't be mobbed. And uh, so I got you know I got to know Linda and the kids, and and it's interesting. About a, I don't know how, many months later, I happened to see him in uh, the Hyatt Hotel, in the coffee shop. He was with Fred Weintraub. And he invited me over to meet Fred. And he looked pretty thin at that time, you know. And uh, two days later, he passed away. Well, he was very involved with, uh, with the Game of Death. And he wanted, you know, he was writing the script and he rewrote it a number of times. and. Uh, he, he wanted to 
uh, make that another another big film like way and so you know then of course he did enter the dragon with a uh, big Hollywood production and sadly he never never got to see the final when it came out he passed away before it came out one night I was was supposed to have, or I was having dinner with uh, Raymond Chow and George Lasby of 007. And we were waiting for Bruce to come, and Bruce was late. Betty called Raymond and said, I can't wake Bruce up. He took a nap and I uh, can't wake him up. So Raymond rushed over to her apartment and he couldn't wake him up, so finally he called the doctor, and the doctor comes, he can't wake him up, so finally they called the ambulance. By then it's too late, and they, uh, he died on the, on the way to the hospital. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as everybody knows, it, he had migraine headaches. He actually used to have them quite often on the set, and he would just kind of collapse and We'd wait 20 minutes, and he'd get up, say sorry about that, and, and uh, let's get going. But uh, that's what finally did him. I, th I think what really killed him was the fact that he uh, w would work it out so much. You know, he would on the set between changing the lights, he would drop down to under push-ups. He, he never stopped, never stopped kicking, and. and uh, of course, then he'd go home and work at his gym for another how many hours, and it was just too much. You know, a blood vessel broke in his brain, and he died. It was just like uh, he, he worked out too much, really. Well, it was just unreal. I mean, I first saw it when I was walking down the street, saw the headlines in the, in the newspaper, Bruce Lee dies. I mean, the whole city was in shock. I mean, it was really, everybody, everybody was talking about it. How could such a great, uh, fantastic physical specimen die at age 32? And of course, 20,000 people went to his funeral and it was, a, it was a sad time. I've asked people all over the world, whether young or old or male or female, I said, have you heard of Bruce Lee? Everybody in the world has heard of Bruce Lee. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, you could ask people who the President of the United States is, and a lot of them don't know. And, uh, but everybody knows Bruce, and he just, it, it's, it's a phenomenon, really. I, I don't know. It's hard to explain why, but uh, even people who have no knowledge of martial arts have heard of him, you know. <clears throat> well, I would recommend uh, reading some of his books because they're very deep, uh, very philosophical. Uh, it would help anybody in, in their daily life. Uh, it's, he was uh, a unique personality, and that's why he's still remembered today after all these years. I think he'd be still uh, uh, teaching people. You know, he wrote six books. He was a great philosopher. I think he would have uh, just kept doing that and, and uh, educating people, helping them make themselves better. And uh, you know, he was he was very he was a, a, really a terrific person. He did a lot to help, even up to the age of 32. So if he got up to 72, then he would have helped that many more. No, so many people have said that they were going to do do a convention, but it never never happened. So the only one I went to was in Bradford in England, and uh, uh, that was that was good because that was the first time they showed way with the Nanchuk uh, scenes put back in that had been cut before, and we had hundreds of people in the audience, and uh, and they were asking questions. You know, it brought me on the stage. And, and they let me uh, sign autographs. So I had about 200 people lined up. I brought a, a lot of posters and, and uh, photographs of me and Bruce, and they and did, uh, did autographs and uh, for like 10, 10 quid each. So that was 
that was uh, good. It was in, uh, we rented a big ballroom in a hotel. 300 Japanese made a special trip from Japan and uh, they showed scenes that hadn't been shown before and martial arts exhibitions and and they were in the audience where we showed uh, various clips from films that, uh, you know, that had been cut before but hadn't been seen before. They had martial arts exhibitions and uh, the uh, the moderator was up on the stage and I was up there smoking a cigar and he just happened to say more of a joke. He said, what am I bid for John Ben's cigar? And it went up 100, 200, 300, 400. Some guy finally paid 500 Hong Kong dollars for my half smoked cigar. Juicy, and, you know. So I had a, a fresh one. I said, you want to take this? He said, no, 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 I want that one. Go figure. Well, I had this space in, in uh, Hong Kong, and I had some of his memorabilia. And the fact that nobody else had done anything, uh, I decided to set up Bruce Lee Cafe Museum. And uh, I tried to get the government to help do something, but they wouldn't. So I, I did it all. I spent quite a bit of money on developing it and uh, putting it together. And, but it was very successful, and we had over, well over 20,000 people come from all over the world. There were over 200 uh, <clears throat> magazine, newspaper articles, uh, 28 TV stations sent crews from various parts of the world. They made me a good, goodwill ambassador of Hong Kong because we brought so many tourists in, so it, it worked out very well. Yeah, I worked with uh, uh, many of the government officials trying to get them. I was in a bad location, halfway up uh, up the mountain in Hong Kong, and, but people still came up. You know, buses came up, brought a lot of tourists. But it, I wanted to set up some place in Kowloon where the, the tourist area was. But it got no zero help from the government, only saying, uh, well, we think it's a good idea and keep up the good work. So. Nothing. Oh, Shannon came and, and uh, I invited people over to meet her and she gave, gave us all autographs and, uh, and she was very appreciative uh, that, that I had done something for her father. Uh, Linda came one time when I wasn't there and uh, they were very, because they were appreciative that no, nobody else had done it, they didn't charge me any licensing fee or, or whatever, so I appreciated that. Um, yeah, it, it had, uh, I, I was leaving Hong Kong and I tried to find some investors who would keep it going, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, I couldn't. And so then I just ended up, and besides the fact that the uh, landlord had doubled the rent and, and it was difficult at that time, so I just better to uh, to close it. Media Asia took all the memorabilia and put it in storage. I guess it's still there. Well, I think uh, yeah, that's that's really true because um, my interaction with with Bruce <clears throat> that movie led me to now I've been in fifty two movies and. Uh, a lot of CCTV television series, which would not have happened had it not been for being in Where the Dragon. You know, people people call up and and say, "Are you free to do this movie, or that movie?" Uh, I'm going to Beijing next week to be in another one, and uh, so it definitely had an impact on on uh, my life, my career, and I'm thankful that. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to be in that first movie. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting time. It was a, a big Hollywood production. It showed for a long time in, in China. And uh, I, I played a, an American gambler who was the only one who bet that Jet Li would win the fight. The other other gamblers uh, 
bet that he would lose because they poisoned his tea. So Jet did win, and I got all the money. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, with Russell Crowe and Lucy Liu, and they brought in a lot of martial artists from all over the world. I played a plantation owner in the 1870s, and uh, I'm on my deathbed, and I want to give freedom to Pam Greer, who's been my nanny for 20, 40 years. And she says, no, Master, give it to my son. He's only 20. And, I, and uh, so I give the son the, uh, his freedom. And he's, he's the one who, he's Raza, and he's the one who goes to, to China and gets the iron fist. So I told Raza that uh, cigar is my trademark. I always have a cigar in every movie. And he says, you can't have a cigar. You're on your deathbed. I said, that's why I want a cigar. So he said, okay. <laughs> Bruce Lee and me? Don't even think about it. <laughs> I, I would, I would, I, I say, I give. Um, other than that, just being on the set with him every day uh, was a real joy. I mean, he was a terrific guy, fun to work with.